Thank you, Father God. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. All that you do. We really consecrate ourselves to you. This whole week, Father, we consecrate ourselves to you. That you may have your way in our midst. That you may do all that you want to do. We thank you, Father. Give you all the glory, worship, and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap of praise. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you, musicians and worshippers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, I think uh, we can hear, right, without a mic? Is that all right? You need a mic? It's okay? You can hear clearly the back? You can't then? We need a mic. No. Can I hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. You can hear from the back. Okay, then that's good. Uh, and, um, well, uh, this week we are expecting, this week, the next week, we are expecting miracles in fact. Uh, uh, just before the service, uh, uh, Deborah was talking about the people that were the hosts uh, that they do need some miracles. And uh, so she asking, okay, when should she bring them? They're willing to come for miracles. And uh, so I suggested the next week, so that this week we soak in. And uh, so next week we have morning teaching uh, and uh, on healing, and then in the evening we will have the miracle service but this week anyone who comes we still minister to them and um, we have been looking into one of the sisters who had come, who had come from um, uh, the USA COG she has come and she has been prayed for before and uh, she is suffering from cancer and we have seen many people heal of cancer uh, we will continue to see them here uh, and uh, so these are some of the things that we can expect during this outpouring so that uh, miracles, signs and wonders are part and a parcel of all that God wants to do. Uh, we do have authority and power over all sickness and diseases. Uh, we need to be able to learn to channel them. As I, as I mentioned again, it's not so much whether we have those power and authority, but it's whether we know how to flow into it, how to channel and uh, in, in what God wants to do. Uh, so she was here this morning in our morning service. Uh, her name again, we're going to continue to pray for her. June, is it? Virginia. Virginia. Okay, we pray for Virginia. And uh, so when uh, uh, she says she'll come, I think she'll come tomorrow night if I'm not uh, wrong, tomorrow night, the next day. And uh, when I was praying for her, uh, the Lord started showing things uh, and uh, one of the things the Lord showed was that uh, she had made a recent trip to Africa uh, by recent I mean about uh, the time I asked her how long was her sickness and disease uh, her cancer and it's about a year if I'm not uh, uh, wrong and uh, all you were there when I was talking to her uh, she was waiting there right through the end of the service uh, and then the Lord started to show things and and the Lord started to show that uh, because when I look into her eyes, remember when you're ministering, healing, you're ministering, whatever, you must pick up what is happening in a person's spirit. It's spirit to spirit. And the, the, the moment I look into her eyes, I see this great fear that grip her. I could see that that sphere of fear is also gripping onto her and uh, don't want to let go and uh, so I said uh, when did this great fear come to you and she said that it's since the uh, ailment and the sickness then I tried to locate it further went further back and uh, so all these things happened after she make a trip to Africa and so then I pick up that uh, there was something that occurred there 
and of course she has family back then and asked whether there were any family members who knew the Lord and apparently none of them knew the Lord and so I said uh, besides whatever has happened there do you bring anything back is was there anything given to you uh, and so I began to see some objects and some things so she says no uh, she's trying to recall so I we sent her back today and uh, 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 rather we told her to go back and check what she has brought forth and uh, we see whether she comes tomorrow or the next day but uh, once uh, we uh, cut the chain or remove the link that is there that the spirit of fear has an attachment upon her we believe that the Lord will just make the cancer dis disappear Amen. so it's important for us to discern what the Lord wants to do uh, and uh, in all that God uh, has for us as we pray but besides um, besides the healing and the miracles that we can expect that God wants to do we also uh, can expect other things and that is I believe in this uh, time that we spend with the Lord we will be able to see transfiguration and transformation take place in each one of our lives as the Lord so permits and determines and that is why we are looking into this uh, teaching series on uh, transfiguration this morning I introduced uh, the subject of in uh, Sunday morning so uh, Sunday afternoon service we introduced the subject of how the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew chapter 17 Mark chapter 9 Luke chapter 9 are all linked to the kingdom of God Jesus did say, there are some standing here who will not see death until they see the kingdom of God. So the transfiguration was actually a demonstration of the kingdom of God. Also the context in which he spoke of the uh, transfiguration, he also spoke about how that, uh, it, that the Son of Man will come in his glory, in his second coming. And uh, then... Then only he turned around and says there are some here standing here will see that kingdom of God. So we know that the transfiguration is linked to the kingdom of God. The transfiguration is also linked to the glory of God. The transfiguration is also linked to the second coming of Jesus. And it is repeated for us again in 2 Peter chapter 1. When Peter recalled the incident of transfiguration and Peter says that uh, we have hold fast this word that we have received and it talks about the glory of Jesus second coming so there's no doubt that the scripture links the transfiguration to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to the kingdom of God coming on earth and to the glory of God being demonstrated on earth which are all part of this end time move this end time move precedes the second coming which is in the rapture and then in later on at the end of tribulation the second coming uh, of Jesus coming to the earth but this end time move also uh, typifies the kingdom of God that rise in the time of the ten toes that is the kingdom and this is a kingdom that symbolizes the glorious church and the glorious church has the glory of God the thing about Peter, James and John when they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration is they themselves did not get transfigured. They only saw the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus. They themselves did not get to be transfigured. But in this outpouring and in this move that God has for us, we will be able to tap into that. And I'm going to talk about principles that are in line with this area let's start with one simple principle from the old testament where we are a glimpse of a transfiguration just a glimpse in the life of moses and that will be in exodus um let's see where, whether we're linked up together okay let me link that up Yep. And uh, in Exodus 
chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Wow, this is really tiny. No matter how big I make it, I don't think you can ever see that one. Right. Is that the biggest? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just know there's a Bible there. <laughs> okay. And, um, so, uh, Exodus chapter 33 was when uh, Moses met up with the Lord and the Lord promised his presence. And then the Lord says, when Moses asked to see the glory of the Lord in verse 18. He says, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. So, he didn't actually even see the fullness of the glory of God. He just saw a little glimpse. And God mentioned about how he will pass by, he will hide Moses in the cleft of the rock. And then as God was about to finish his entrance, then he take his hand off Moses and just let him see a little bit of the glory of God. That was all he had. Uh, now, he didn't see the panim of God, which is the face of God. He saw the back parts of God's glory. In the new covenant, we see the panim, the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so he only saw the back parts as God passed by. Well, in chapter 34, is the occurrence exactly as the Lord has promised. It was 5. The Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So Moses made haste, bow his head to the ground, and worship. Then he said, If now I found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us. Even though we are stiff necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin. Take us as your inheritance. And so God spoke to him and promised uh, all the promises that he has uh, unto him. And God did exactly that and he saw the glory of God. And then in verse 29, Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. Now remember, by verse 29, he had fasted 120 days. So some of you are thinking of fasting just one week, eh? He had fasted 120 days. Now I know it's not just the fasting, but uh, imagine his consecration to God. This is the Old Testament. That... I see, might be God, he really sought the Lord. First 40 days, and he received the law which he broke because of the sin of the Israelites worshipping the golden calf. Second 40 days recorded in the book of Deut Deuteronomy when he was kneeling down and he was interceding for them for 40 days and 40 nights. Third 40 days, when he cut the stone and went up for God to write on the stone. Now he is coming down. 120 days. He has not drunk any drink. He has not ate any food. His body was actually supernaturally sustained. 
So bear that in mind that in the Old Testament there was a lot that is going on here. In the New Testament, by the grace of God, a lot of processes have been done for us in Christ and we absorb His DNA. So by saying that, I don't mean that any one of you, when you hear this sermon, even those online, you never know. Those who are here, you can ask questions and then I might stop you from starving yourself, you know. <laughs> Or whatever you're trying to do, you say, "Wow, I better. This is the move of God. I better, I better go without food and water for 120 days. Either somewhere in the middle of it, we'll be visiting you in a hospital with tubes all over you, <laughs> unless of God, God supernaturally sustain you, or." Oh, we might be conducting your funeral service <laughs> which we do not want to of course God can raise you up from the dead <laughs> but I don't think God intends for us to do that you know to purposely make you die and raise you up from the dead again you know? just for the sake of making you die and raising you from the dead uh, now, this is Old Testament but I want to point to the fact that his physical body has already gone to some change why do I point to the fact so that you can understand by the time what God does now when he saw the glory of God that it was an added measure to a certain price that he has paid for about let's say that if God sh show his glory maybe towards the end of the last few days let's take it the last last day since God got a lot of business to do with him and all the things God had to do and then towards the end he said okay I'll show you my glory now I'm about to go and I'll show you my glory let's say he has it uh, towards the uh, last day which would mean that uh, his body has gone through some sort of purging and transformation uh, or suspended animation for about uh, 119 days before whatever glory God has to come upon his life but what came upon his life when he saw the back part of God's glory was indeed also amazing let's look at that in verse 29 and it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that his, the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. In visions we saw that his face was so bright like the sun shining. Very, very bright. And when he was coming down from that mountain top the second time, carrying the two tablets in the first time when he came down nobody noticed anything and there was none of this spectacular thing but in the second time his face was shining and he says exactly where it was the skin of his face and the bible says the skin of his face so the layer of skin on his face his epidermis was shining and phosphorescent bright as the sun according to the book of 2nd Corinthians <coughs> chapter 3 it slowly faded so it's not like it's not like Moses had it all the rest of his life so you can imagine, if those days they had sunglasses, everyone talking to Moses when they wear sunglasses. <laughs> and Moses said, why are you wearing sunglasses? We can't see you. Uh, no, he slowly faded that glory. Until on the day that he was to go home, that uh, the glory of God, the glory of God had already faded away from his skin. Otherwise, it would be quite a frightening experience. Don't forget that after this, there were a lot of rebellions. There were a lot of people who say, uh, stone Moses. Hey, how do you stone a man with a face shining like, like Bob? <laughs> so obviously, it all disappeared. And 
when it went back to his normal skin, everybody forgot. I doubt if his face was shining like the sun all the time that uh, they would have rebelled. Because all they had to look at him and say, hey, that's, that's, that's not, not an ordinary person. And remember, they cannot see, so they were all afraid of him. And uh, Moses, in verse 33, had to put a veil while talking to them. So if they were a bit rebellious, Moses had to open. Da, 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 da. Ah! <laughs> or when they were complaining, he opened the way. Da, 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 da. Ah! That would have been frightening. Right. So obviously, it has slowly faded over time. And uh, by the time they were 40 years in the wilderness, they all forgot about that. And there were different things that happened. And uh, his face looks as normal as any other face. Uh, this phenomena lasted a short time. If I were to look at it in visions to estimate, now it's very hard in the spirit when you see visions to estimate the time. But so unless God reveal, of course, which is a different thing. But we're looking into a vision and you're wanting to see how long it lasted. Well, I was going to say something, but I say, I better let you guess first. How long do you think it lasted? Another 40 days. Wow, good guess at 40 days. Okay, anybody else? Eh? 120. 120 days okay 3 months yes. which is 120 days okay anybody else any guess how long did his face shine don't forget uh, his wife would say quickly get back to normal <laughs> because every night when she lie down he says Moses can you switch off the light <laughs> And Moses would turn to her and say, What do you say, dear? <laughs> and do you know how bright it was? It was brighter than the afternoon sun at 12 noon. Guess how bright? So, in the midst of the camp of the tent with 3 million people, you can tell at night where Moses was. <laughs> you just look at the tent with the brightest light. Because in those days, there was no electricity. Maybe today with my bright lights, you can produce it. But in those days, they need fire. Uh, and of course, there was a pillar of cloud. But all the tents were basically quite dark, maybe with candlelight. But Moses had a search light inside. Zoom! You could tell which was Moses' tent. And uh, so, but it can be useful, right? The wife will say, hey, Moses, come here. I need to read this little scroll here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then sometime, you know, in a camp, so, so somebody might have lost a key in their key. <laughs> Moses, can you light up the path here? <laughs> Whatever. But we, what we had is this Moses light. Some of you say three months. Wow, very long time. And uh, uh, so either the wife learned to sleep in the sunlight. You know, if anyone here tried to sleep right at 12 noon, you know. And uh, without wearing the blinkers, and you try to sleep in the afternoon sun. I mean, every part of your body, you know, uh, is reacting to the sunlight. In fact, the sunlight makes you wake up. And this was a light that was brighter than the sun. Brighter than the sun. So, 40 days, 120 days, roughly 3 months. 3 months is 3 times 30. What is that? Maybe he had a different sense from his wife maybe, and his waiting period and everything. So that's another angle. Hey, did, what did he say about his wife? he had a different sense. Different sense. Yeah, like, you know, oh, <laughs> so for the, for the three months he lived in his own tent. <laughs> so his wife, his wife would get some extra tent. Maybe a spare tent somewhere. 
and put Moses there. Say, Moses, throughout as long as your face shine, you are sleeping there. Not a bad idea, eh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, as long as you got a light bulb there, sleep over there. Three months. Any, any other guess how long it lasted? Ten days? Yeah. Ten. Interesting. And, uh, so you're just guessing, right? Ten days. Okay, good guess. Uh, interesting. But you notice all your guess in a way is correct. It never lasted for one year. Never lasted for one year. And you could actually pick it out in the spirit. So, let me go to half a year. You think it lasted for half a year? Okay, most of you are saying no. And uh, so now, we cut the half year into another half quarter year. So at most, three months. And the shortest among us, ten days. <laughs> So we are saying that it lasted from 10 days to 40 days to 120 days to 3 months. Uh, not bad, I guess. That is that. Uh, see whether there is a clue that the Bible gave. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul, in speaking about this glory, says that in verse 7 about the law. Now, Paul had two things, both oral tradition and also his own walk and visions in the law. So in verse 7 it says, If the ministry of death written and engraved on stone was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation and glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was more glorious, made glorious, had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excelled. For if what is passing away what is passing away was glorious what remains is much more glorious then he talked about the veil that was on his face in verse 13 unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing so the veil also prevented them from seeing how it was slowly reduced. He mentions that. Go back to the incident in uh, Exodus 34. Exodus chapter 34. And it says in verse 30, Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. Then he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had commanded, he had been commanded. 
And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again after he went in to speak with him. Do you see something there that you might not have seen? What was that? Uh, it's that it seemed like every time Moses went into the presence of God, his face shone again. <laughs> yes! Yeah. And that's the part that none of you notice. So, what happens is that it was rapidly fading. And uh, even though we joke about you now the whole night and building a tent outside for three months, it didn't exactly happen that way. It would have been interesting though. And since this in this revival, we are going to have a lot of transfiguration. If it happened to your husband, <laughs> we have prepared a tent for him. <laughs> gonna be, you're going to be part of the revival, right? Right, so we must get a tent ready. <laughs> when he comes to Canada, he say, My dear, remember we talked about the glorious church? Yes. And he said, you know that, that, that extra tent there? Yes. That's for you. <laughs> huh, for me? Yes. When your face shines like Moses, uh, we will put you in a tent. That will be interesting. Yeah. No. So what we have is that actually it faded quite rapidly. And it was dependent on one thing. The presence of God. In fact, within that day itself, it slowly faded. Let me give you some clues from other scriptures. Okay? Let's bring our Lord Jesus Christ. Transfiguration. How long did it last? Our Lord Jesus' transfiguration. Less than a day. He was transfigured up there. His clothes were shining. By the time he came down the mountain, nobody knew what happened. Everything went back to normal. Within one day. So since we want Jesus to have the gold medal, Anybody want to give Jesus a silver medal and put Moses a gold medal? <laughs> Thank you very much. Three days. Right? Huh? Hey. I, I changed my other three Oh, you will change, yes. Three days. Three days. Yeah. Okay. Dependent on one thing which we will discover. Oh. See, he just freshly came from God's presence. And the moment he leave, even though it was still shining, it was already going on. If our Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured far superior to Moses, would you agree? Yes. That our Lord Jesus' glory was far beyond Moses, thousands of folk, thousand folks. Because our Lord Jesus didn't have sin nature. Our Lord Jesus spirit, soul and body was perfect and when he chose to be transfigured he was fully transfigured and there was a difference Moses only his face our Lord was transfigured from the top of his head to the tip of his toes including his clothing if, if Jesus had been wearing black clothing it would have been shiny white. It so happened that Jesus' clothing most of the time was beige. And it became brilliant white like the sun. So the whole being and figure of Jesus was shining. Even his clothes were shining. The only thing is Peter, James and John might not have a scientific mind. 
if it was some of us, of course you don't dare to take sample from Jesus' skin cell. Say, Jesus, can I have a sample of your blood? <laughs> None of them would dare to ask. But some of us might look at his clothing very carefully and see whether the shine was still there. And what happened to his clothing? I'm as interested in the clothing he wore because it's most likely <coughs> cotton and linen and that linen molecules were transformed became phosphorescent and it was brighter than the sun but the moment it came down from the mountain it was all gone I mean if Jesus had come down <coughs> retaining those things the Pharisees were down there remember they were trying to cast out the demon and as Jesus come down with all this light shining tell you every one of them will have do the same thing they did try to make him king but Jesus didn't want them to see it. only three people saw it came down with it so since we want to give Jesus the gold medal it was rapidly deteriorating for Moses when he came down. But here's the thing. For a moment of time, every time he go into God's presence, it strengthened again. And then when he come out, oh there it was all over again. And every time he goes in and out, it seems to strengthen. It's like his skin now became reactable to God's presence. And there was a side effect on his body. His body could not be sick anymore. Even though he was Old Testament. Didn't he say his skin, right? Epidermis, skin cells. And you know, all, on our, all our skin cells are under the bacteria that clings to it. Think about it. What happened to the bacteria? When Moses climbed up and down the mountain, I mean the bacteria you know, clinging on to different things. Uh, I could imagine when Moses crossed the barrier into the glory of God, all the bacteria says, Ah! Died. But they were too small to be heard. The Bible doesn't record the screams of the bacteria. Or the viruses. Or anything that tries to cling to Moses at that time. But definitely, it was impossible for any form of bacteria, virus, sickness and disease to cling to this, the cell. For the very reason by the, when he was 120 years old, Deuteronomy chapter 34 says, Moses' strength was like a young man. His eyesight was perfect. There was nothing that was imperfect on the day he died and God took him home. Side effect of his own taste, a taste of what transfiguration was. But we see some lessons that the presence of God was crucial. That his skin cells obtain, and the molecules that are there, obtain a certain capacity to absorb the presence of God and give out light. If we were to say in scientific terms, it absorbed the spiritual energy and it gave out photons. Because photons are what we see of light wave flowing out. Photons are what comes from the sun that makes the sun bright. So the skin cells could absorb spiritual energy and the side effect radiate photons. And you all know chemistry, right? That what causes light to be emitted. Like for example, uh, this is a piece of metal. If you heat the metal, it, it might not be phosphorescent but it will glow reddish color. Any metal that you heat up, most metals, some metals immediately melt, which is different. But iron, 
and as you see the molten iron and a sword that they try to beat into a sharp sword when they heat it it be glow reddish maybe reddish yellowish and depending on different metal it gives a different color when it cool down the metal does not glow anymore scientifically we know what causes the glow see every atom has a proton and an electron so the electron will have different shells they call it so the first shell might be low orbit then when you heat up an atom when you heat up an atom you say is all this relevant for tonight huh? is tonight chemistry lesson or all night prayer <laughs> it is relevant this illustration is relevant to what you need to understand about absorbing spiritual energy so pay attention to your chemistry teacher for a while <laughs> every atom has a proton uh, has a, a nucleus with a proton and new and neutron and electron floating around circulating it of course they combine and they stuck together to be molecules but still they are individual atoms clustered together or joined together sharing electron part when you heat up the metal let's say the first shell the orbits in order to to absorb it need to absorb energy the electron takes on a higher orbit see all matter can absorb heat it absorbs heat by expanding so the if you were looking under the microscope and let's say you could see the atom as a solid you will see the atom expand because the electrons are going to higher and higher orbit they got different orbits determined by calculations but what happens is having absorbed all the energy when it cools down or when it suddenly uh, cools down let's say from level uh, 1 to level 2 to level 3 level 4 then it rapidly goes down from level 4 3 2 back to 1 it has to release photons energy cannot be lost in the in the realm of physics it only change form from one form to another different types of energy so there is heat energy and is absorbed then is released as photons or light energy usually it's a mixture of different energy but primarily a lot of light energy so you could imagine all the atoms in the skin cell of Moses absorb spiritual energy because there was no natural energy it had the ability to absorb spiritual energy and then when it moves away from God's presence it releases as all the atoms and molecules go back to their normal state instead of their hyperactive state it releases photon but not just a little bit because in visions if you have visions you can see it was bright as the sun so it was not like Moses came down looking like a firefly <laughs> which light you can still see but it's not blinding to the eyes but the light that came was so great they cannot even see and for Jesus not just his skin and his face but his garment can you imagine the linen and the cotton that he was wearing absorb spiritual energy so you can understand his cells absorb energy but what about the molecules of the clothes he wore <coughs> apparently the clothes that Jesus wore can absorb energy by the fact that the woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5 could be healed and there were many others also who were healed by touching his garment we know that the body can have a residue storage of spiritual energy 
from Elisha's bones that store enough energy to raise one person from the dead. We know living matter can contain that. But amazing that linen and cotton clothing can contain that. This energy that was there. Now, having understood all those things and the elements behind them, behind them are a lot of principles that we're gathering for tonight. In this revival, as you spend time in prayer, one of the first principles is to understand that just like just like uh, the, nat the natural law, so is the spiritual law, and both are equal. In fact, natural laws are a reflection of spiritual laws. And they discover something in the natural law. And that is that all energy and photon release is based on quantum quantum and uh, are you all aware of how Einstein discovered E equals to MC squared <coughs> you all know the equation but let me ask further do you know on what basis he discovered it because there was no nuclear explosion yet although his theory points to the possibility of nuclear fission and fusion how did Einstein discover E equals to MC squared? What experiment did he do? <coughs> was it that the light source? That yes, black body radiation. Remember that? Not really, but Okay. Uh, when he, he got two theories. One is the theory of re relativity. When he imagined you traveling on a beam of light that was a theory of relativity which is different but he is well known for E equals to MC squared it was based on black body radiation a calculation that was done by originally um, this German guy that is named after him Planck I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name you might know better Max Planck. Mark Planck. Mark, Mark, Mark. <coughs> Mark Planck discovered the constant, the quantum constant. Because at that time, there were two theories to explain heat absorption and release of photons. And you know, scientists are very exact. <laughs> They have to measure everything to make sure that it's following a certain mathematical law. But there were two theories. One theory fit high energy, and the other theory fit low energy. But the two theories are different. But both are about absorption of heat and radiation of photon. Why two theories to explain one phenomena? And in the end, Planck came up with combining both theories. He says, the theory can work if you limit when you emit the photon. Some of, some of you are saying, what, well, tonight got chemistry lesson, physics lesson. How is this relevant to transfiguration? It is relevant because we are talking about the scientific aspect of spiritual transfiguration. We are trying to make it as simple as possible. So there were these two theories. And you know what he did? What he basically said in simple language is, Photons flow in packets. Quantum is a, is a measurement of packets. So like for example, X amount of photons will flow out. Not like one at a time. So when you heat something up, it must reach X before you get the first phase. 
Then, when you keep hitting it, they keep travelling in packets. Like a herd mentality. They don't just go out individually. Before that, the calculation was individual for thought. So he said, when you add this quantum into it, where you make them travel in packets, then both theories can combine. Because when you got a little heat, then you could see the amount. The quantum doesn't work. But as you keep heating it, no matter how much you heat, it must absorb, let's say, to X amount before it lights up. Then another X amount before it lights up again. So both theory was combined in black body radiation. And that was a fantastic discovery. Why am I touching about quantum tonight? This applies to spiritual laws. When God, remember this afternoon, I talk about 2 Corinthians 3.18, that there are four levels of 2 Corinthians 3.18. Revelation level, knowledge, spiritual knowledge level, glory of God level, and the face of Jesus Christ level. Progression from one to the other is based on a quanta. Which means you need certain things to be full and then it can go to the next realm. Which is why sometimes it takes time for a revival to take place. Because some things need to be absorbed first. Like, uh, uh, by the way, how many of you had a good meal today, knowing tomorrow or now, uh, now too late? We're reading Monday. Pacha midnight. Fasting has begun. <laughs> Monday to Friday. So, uh, of course, you can eat vegetarian or nuts or whatever you want. But uh, yesterday, now that we are past midnight, yesterday, how many of you all had a very good meal preparing for this fast? Just, just a show of hands. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, what do you eat? Burger. Rice, chicken. Rice, chicken. Okay, I went to the supermarket and got uh, uh, some chicken. Uh, anybody else? You ate some things? Cause, of course, some of you might fast all the way through. Fish. Fish. Oh, lovely, that. Fried okay. chicken. Fried chicken. Okay. Now, here's my question. British fish. Whoa! <laughs> the British fish and chips. Okay. <laughs> By the way, uh, some of the Singaporeans are here. I don't know anyone that you tried it, you know. Um, I don't just follow the reviews. The reviews can be wrong. <laughs> because I have followed the Singapore review that Singapore got few. There's one called So Shiok and all the others. I look at all of them. Some put this duck is good. That's not good. I trace that. The duck was horrible. <laughs> so their taste was different from mine. And uh, so I have my own taste. I remember looking for my number one dark rice and uh, so when it shut down, I, look, I tried to look for the number two since number one closed shop until the number one reopened again and uh, to some cousin or somebody so we got the number one dark rice up and running again and not too bad, you know, he still got the same sauce, same taste and everything else and uh, why are you talking about dark when you're fasting, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, probably be a test. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, uh, this, uh, this, these uh, British chips in, in, uh, in Singapore, it beats the one that... Uh, Hello UK folks! Uh, uh, the five star one near... What area did we, we stay? Dagenham. Dagenham, they pronounce it. Dagenham? Or Dagenham. Some of them pronounce it Dagenham. I don't know. The girl is gone. Dagenham, but you got Dagenham or something. Dagenham. Okay. Supposed to be five star fish and chips. Right. After we re review it, only 2.5 stars. <laughs> okay. If five star is seven, so we, we give it about 5.5, you know, maybe. And um, so, uh, roughly about five. But the one in Bamoro Plaza, along Bukit Timah Plaza, uh, cooked by a British guy. His name is Smith. A very British name. 
His picture is pasted all over when you go to the shop. And you know the one thing? He had, I sat there and ate with my son before he left for Korea. There were crowds that keep coming. Keep coming. And he survived just selling fish and chips. He didn't act like the chicken rice store in Singapore when they tried to survive and they're not so... They're famous but not good enough because, you know, not everybody eats chicken rice every day. So the chicken, even the famous chicken rice had to add different things. You go to Buntong Ki, Siu Ki, then they will try to sell you, hey, what about this rice? What about this veggie? What about this? You know, very few of them want to survive just on chicken rice. But this guy survived just on fish and chips. I try the haddock the next time and see. The only thing was it got 6.5 because it was a little bit oily. If it was not oily, it would have a 7.0. That's how good it was. And the fish is more fresh than the dagenum. It was more fresh. Wow. And I don't know how he got his fish, but I, when we passed the road again, uh, ah, okay. okay. But but his batter was different. This guy's batter. And then I, when we passed by that day again, uh, I tried to look at the words that he put, and it seems that he advertised that he got all his fish specially fresh and imported. So he really knows his stuff. Okay, let's not go digress too much since we are fasting. But you have your chicken and all those things, right? So I'm asking here now. Uh, <laughs> do you eat anything today? Uh, yeah, burger. So it will be beef. Uh. Yeah. Good, good meat. You ate good meat. Wow. Okay. Whoa. Okay. I wonder where you find goat meat. Makes me curious. Chichi, Chichi, find goat meat. Oh, you cook ah? Oh, because I haven't found goat meat stalls in Washington DC or in Maryland. Oh, you brought the goat meat. Whoa. Okay. Okay. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. What was the point we are getting at? And uh, how long does it take for the chicken, the burger, the goat to become part of yourself? There must be a quantum. Right? It's not like you put the chicken next to you and it ends up. That would be a fantastic new way. Unless they liquefy it and then they take out all the best things they can, then they might inject it. <laughs> it's not so delicious anymore. Right? Or they put a tube in here and then they nourish you. Right? So somehow you must convert that burger, that good meat, and you actually cook. Yes. <laughs> She actually cooked the good meat. She did. They brought some here today. Right? Wow, okay. So I guess you're not going to see for the next five days. <laughs> Freeze it. <laughs> okay. How long does it take to convert that into a cell in your body? At least 24 hours. Now, there was one eater of fish, maybe a couple of hours or half a day. And you know, fish digest faster than meat or red meat. So it takes time. That is what I call a quantum. The minimum time you need for whatever you take to become a part of you is definitely not measured in a human body not measured in a few seconds. It's measured in hours, maybe hard to digest in a day or so. Some things are faster converting into a part of yourself. Some things are slower. That is called a quantum. Even in natural food, we have a quantum 
for the time you eat for it to become a part of you of course if you mix protein powder and all that it might be faster because it has been already digestible convertible but there is a quanta a, quan, a quantum a minimum time by which it needs to convert and we are men men measuring quant quantum of time there can be a quantum of material like light and here's the thing even spiritual energy is based on quanta which means that when you receive a revelation it might take a certain amount of time because that revelation become a part of your DNA if you see a vision and experience Jesus it might take some time for that experience to become a part of you just like different types of food some types of food are absorbed faster than others there is an optimum period and there is also an effect based on yourself like for example if your body is sickly then it's harder to absorb your body will reject but if you have exercise and your body is healthy then it absorbs it converts the food into muscles into parts of your body uh, so there is certain things that determine how fast how slow you absorb translate that into transfiguration in this week and in this month as we wait upon the Lord all the way to September see this fast is all the way to September except that uh, in some of the weekdays we might allow a bit more eating but more or less it's quite a long fast that we go all the way and after September we have the uh, one week prayer two weeks miracle service in Singapore uh, and a week of prayer in Australia and uh, so we are constantly having that that's why I say okay weekends take a break weekdays we fast again and uh, there is a quantum a quanta of absorption and transfiguration we need to flow with it in the realm of uh, sports training there is a book that I have in my library called uh, quantum fitness in which they want in they say that no one can perform at their peak a hundred percent of the time so in their training they try to pick at the time when they need to pick because every one of our body goes through a wavelength just like we need time of sleep I said this week is unusual week where we really push in into God but then we don't do these type of things frequently we don't do it like for one year although that will be interesting <laughs> okay and our body needs time of wake time of sleep that itself already is looking at the waves when your body sleep it slows down when you're awake it wakes up which is why they always tell you that the best time to exercise is later in the day and if you want to do it in the morning you got to warm up your body first but your body benefits the most when it's fully awake and then you exercise and then some people they don't realize that they're running against the body like uh, sometimes when just John drops me off uh, after all night prayer or after a late night meeting in the church then by the time we arrive back and he dropped me off about 11 p.m. sometimes people stay back and they ask me for prayer for all those things by the time we reach back 11 p.m. to nearly 12 midnight and then as we go near my place there and you find some of the people jogging and I say what is this guy jogging at 11 p.m. and then another person walking at 10 p.m. And say, why are these people exercising at a time when your body wants to sleep? Can you imagine having a five mile jog 
and then you come back and you thought ah you know well your body is all kicked up and I have another book that shows that when you exercise at night and when you exercise during sunlight is different go and read about it there are a lot of scientific research your body reacts differently you say oh I didn't know that they are rubbing against their own body how long can it last before we see something break down some people say oh my body you say I always exercise at night when the sun set and then sleep when the sun rise unless your DNA has changed until you become a nocturnal animal <laughs> It is possible you can survive that way. So maybe you got polar bear genes. <laughs> you hibernate a lot. Possibly. But normal humans sleep and rest when there's no sunlight. And we work when it's day. Because when there's no... Do you know why sometimes we soften the lights in all night prayer? Because your body has a sensor for light. It can tell when light is there. Not just your eyes. Your eyes can tell. Your body has a sensor. And the moment you switch off all the lights, let's say very little light or darkness, your body starts producing a chemical called melatonin. Melatonin is what makes you sleepy. So some of you say, oh, I don't feel sleepy. You know? So all night prayer, you turn on all the lights. It's like your son baby. Oh, like, hey, make the light hotter. Oh, whatever. You can do that temporarily. But anything that you do to last a lifetime must flow with the way God created you. Sensible, right? It's common sense. It got created us in a certain way, you don't rub against it. You can violate those things from time to time. And your body can take it. It's built for stress. But you don't purposely do it. Until it's upside down, the whole system. Because somewhere along the way, your body will start showing signs of physio and fracture in different areas. Because it was pushed into what it was not created or designed to do. So tonight, when we go in all night prayer, and the light soften, and suddenly you get more sleepy, it's because of your melatonin. And we all produce different amounts. Then some of you say, oh, now I've got a key. I don't want to be sleepy. So, you have a search light when you pray. Wait, let me tell you the benefits of melatonin. They have discovered that when your body produces normal melatonin, they have what we call the junk DNA. You know, your DNA is a strand, but when the strand finishes, it still got extra long strand, what we call spare parts. So that when something happens, the spare part goes in and, and, and keep repairing. So it's called the junk DNA, which is a long strand. And people with long life have a long strand. But as you age, the strand becomes shorter and shorter. And they found that when the strand is very, very short, <coughs> aging starts catching up with people, and then they're close to dying. So oh, those spare parts are important. Those junk DNA, the extra long strand that continue even after the main component is there. It's just like when your hard disk is full, it's different. Your, your computer, especially Windows computer, I, I'm still testing this Apple, but I'm sure it's the same principle. That you need spare space for what we call uh, uh, artificial RAM memory. Because even though you might have RAM memory, physical RAM memory, the system uses your hard disk as a spare memory too. And it creates a section. So when your hard disk is full, 
your Windows computer runs slower because the extra space it uses is smaller and smaller. And if you've got lots of room, it uses a whole jump, chum, chum, and then it operates fast. Which is why the longer you use it, the more you've got to clean it up. All the things so that it's as good as new, like when you freshly install. But the longer you use it, a lot of different things keep running until it slows down your computer. <coughs> the junk DNA, and they discovered this. If your body goes too long without pro producing melatonin, the youth process, the youthful, youthfulness process, begins to diminish. And the aging process starts setting in. Ah. Can you see that? That's your natural set. Now, outside talking all this natural area, let's talk about the spiritual principles that we're comparing. We have spoken about this fact that the body needs a quanta and a quantum to absorb. And then, unless, it, uh, unless a certain thing is a certain amount, it can, it's not ready for absorption. And you need also a quantum of time for it to properly be ready for the next download or the next absorption. We must flow with that. It cannot be hurried. And sometimes we can make decisions that hinder that. Like for example, under step two, step two is a collection of revelation, correct? It's a collection that produces a knowledge. Let's say it takes X amount. So your amount is now quarter X, 0.25 X, or 0.5 X, half of it. It's not sufficient to get into step two. You might need one X, then two X. Let's say it goes in whole figures. <coughs> it's obvious that doubts, unbelief, prevent absorption. Even in a nanosecond moment, Peter was walking on water in Matthew chapter 14. In the middle of walking on water, he started doubting. Within a few seconds, he started sinking. It was an instant because he has not absorbed the power to walk on water. When it is within your own capacity, you can walk on water. <coughs> like I said, the day will come when we don't need Jesus to say, Come. Because you live above the law of physics and you're above the elements of the earth, you walk on water like Jesus. But for Peter, not born again yet, he was dependent on the command of Jesus. So what was happening was he latched on to Jesus' energy. And when you're latching on to something, it's just like, uh, you know, the people who are doing skiing, water skiing, being pulled by a speedboat. The moment the speedboat stops speeding, you also start sinking. It is a speed that was pulling you. So sometimes you're latching on, which is what some people don't know, that you might be latching on to somebody's anointing. And you're functioning under authority. And it works, and you thought it's you. Or sometimes you're freshly connected to something Jesus revealed to you, but not absorbed yet. In those cases, within nanoseconds of unbelief, the whole thing can stop working. And sometimes, during the latching on period before you absorb, because you must eat food before you can absorb it. If in the midst of eating, you reject and vomit it out, the rest cannot continue. And it's very critical. During the time of a famine, when, uh, I believe it was Elijah, who says, by tomorrow, the famine will end. 
and such will be so for so much, so, so much. One of the soldiers mocked him, said, Ha! You know, it cannot be. Immediately, because he reacted the moment the word was delivered. It was still a latching process. The moment he reacted with unbelief, judgment fell. And he says, Every one of us will, will have food, you will die. Because it was still energy latching on. And he chose to latch wrongly. What happened if God sent electrical cables in the spirit to latch on? And you choose to connect it wrongly. Instant, instant death. So understand this quanta that is happening or the spiritual energy. <coughs> There's time when it is critical not latched properly. Like for example, when they're constructing this building or next time you see construction. Or when they're building a computer that we're using now or any area. During the construction phase, isn't it important that, okay, like if I'm building a computer, I'll say, hey, don't let any dusty thing come. I don't need to get into the CPU when I'm putting the CPU on top. Or when you're doing electrical wiring, that's not the time for people to bring in the furnishing and put it on the floor and lie down and sleep and make a living room yet. Say, no, let me hide all the wirings safely and all of them protected by insulators. And when you finish, then you can come and decorate the building. So the electrician must finish first before you can start using the PowerPoint. Otherwise, it's unsafe. So notice, there's a time, a quantum time for everything. As we move in this revival, we must understand the laws of spiritual physics, which are irrespective of who we are. We have to respect the laws of God. The law of the spirit of life has made us free from the law of sin and death. They are spiritual laws. And when we go against the spiritual laws, we suffer. Already people have violated spiritual laws. You know some of the most basic spiritual laws they know. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, correct? Speak no evil if you desire long life. Isn't it? Look at sometimes people who oppose this move. Why must they speak evil? It was unnecessary. They could have taken a Gamaliel stand. If they don't understand the move, keep quiet. Say, if it's of God, you continue not of God, let it be so. But when you choose to speak again, you already tie your destiny. No one need to pronounce judgment. By the time a prophet pronounced judgment, it was only confirming what has happened in the spirit. There are a lot of laws that go on in the spirit. And a lot of things that happen when God is imparting His energy. Which is why we come to this basic law. And that is point number one. That is, say, wow. How long have we been going? Two hours, 37 minutes, now point one. Don't worry, we we'll recover all the points, we just summarize for you. <laughs> you see, but I didn't hear the point, which is why we are summarizing the points. <laughs> you find it in all the sermons. See, sermons come out differently. Point one there is a gradual process, even in transfiguration. Each one is a quanta. I come to Moses after, I want to put that as a first point. My God wants to put the other one as a first point. In Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'll just give you all the points and get ready for prayer. In Luke chapter 9. It tells us in verse 28. It came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. And we all know in cross-references, 
in Matthew 17 and Mark 9, he uses the phrase metamorphosis. So there was a transformation. And his robe became white and glistening. Then two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease. While the rest of them, Peter, James and John, were heavy with sleep. It says, and only in the Gospel of Luke does it say, as he prayed. How long did that prayer process took? Let's say they go up early in the morning and they climb up to the Mount Transfiguration. By the way, this is not the Mount of Olives. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration, which different scholars have pointed to different mountains up in the north of Galilee, uh, of uh, Israel. And so when they go in the morning, depends on how tall the mountain was. If it's a reasonable height, it takes at least a few hours of hiking, walking. So give them a few hours to reach there. By the time they are praying here, and then they came down. Look at verse 37. It happened on the next day. Do you know that they came down the next day? Next day. Which means they spent all night in the mountain. And here's another place I'd like you to take another guess. Since they most likely go up in the morning, so by the time they reached there was either mid-morning or late morning and they came down the next day and I assume when they went there they started praying right so let's say mid-morning to late morning to the next day when they came down here's my question at which point did the transfiguration take place? Mid-afternoon, early evening, late night, early morning of the next day. Late night or early morning? Late night to early morning. Yeah, the three disciples are really cooling. Yes, they were falling asleep. There are clues given to you. Of course, some people sleep every time they are praying. <laughs> because we try all day prayer before. Yes, we have all night prayer. From usually from uh, 10 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m. In Australia, we used to have it 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. And people do still fall asleep. You change why would that people fall asleep? <laughs> and then we also try uh, whole day prayer like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. so that's half a day and uh, still people fall asleep in the afternoon yeah they still fall asleep they pray it's the middle of the day <laughs> So, yeah, so far tonight, nobody has fallen asleep yet. But I'm sure those of you in Singapore enjoy some of the snorings that come through during the preaching time. Because sometimes our preaching does start about 12 midnight or 1 a.m. By the time I'm preaching my long service or, uh, on Friday night, it could be 2, 3 a.m. And so those guys, especially some of them, you know, they... They didn't have night money, they came from work and they got. <laughs> I, they, they are either saying hallelujah or they are really enjoying the sermon so much. Oh. Surrender and touched by the Lord. Only thing when you go near them, you hear sounds like purring. 
and that's all right. You know, my rule is that you now that's that's fine. You know, let them rest a little bit. In fact, some of them very guilty. Say, hey, Pastor, come all night. I slept. So never mind. At least you're here. You know? <laughs> and it does something to you. I want your life to be changed and transformed. And uh, so I say, as long as you don't snore too loudly, <laughs> interrupt my sermon. So you can imagine after every sentence, you go, <laughs> hey, say something. <laughs> Next sentence. <laughs> Next center, <laughs> and I say, you know, that is when I, I will signal say. <laughs> and so you see me signaling like that, <laughs> then you know the silent signal, you know, they, they wake that guy up kind of thing. Uh, but we know from the clue that the disciples were very, very, very sick. And let's say you say from late midnight, night, late, night, late night. night. By late night, it's 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. for you. 10. No, to me, it's like uh, 2 3 a.m. To night. early morning. Uh. So 10 p.m. to yeah. 2 3 a.m. No, no. Uh, 2 3 a.m. to early morning. Oh, so that's when you think the transfiguration took place. Okay. Any other guess when the transfiguration took place? Everybody set up pretty much around, pretty around. Much around there in yeah. the early morning. Yes. If if that was so, let's say it's 2, 3 a.m. or 1 a.m. even. And if they had gone up at 10 a.m., by the time they pray from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., that is 12 hours. 12 hours. So from 10 p.m. to 12 midnight, that adds another 2 hours. That means 14 hours. And then whatever time in the morning adds to that. So let's say they, they, they reach the, the place to pray at 10 a.m. Easy to count. Which means by 12 midnight that day, they would have been waiting on the Lord for 14 hours. Then any other time it takes, like say 2 a.m. will add another 2 hours. 3 a.m. add 3 more hours. 3 a.m. will mean that they have been waiting on the Lord for 17 hours. So why are you guys ready? Are you guys ready in this week to wait upon the Lord? And we have spread it out a little bit. Instead of just the whole day, we, we give you time, and the babe change come, babe change come. They say, why don't 24 hours while well, stay here? You know, oh, oh, hallelujah. Yeah, like a hero. Eh? <laughs> Try to get up every day at 3 a.m. to pray. Only succeed two times. <laughs> do something more reasonable. Get up like 5 or 6 a.m. Then you do it constantly rather than just do it twice and the rest of the time forgot about it. Number one, there is a time process. There is a time process. You must allow the time process to take place. Why? Right? So I ask for you since you're so quiet. Why? Already answered in the sermon. Quantum, quanta. It takes time to absorb the energy. By the time there's so much energy absorbed and Jesus was ready to shine, He really shined brighter than the sun. If Jesus wanted to be more incognito, He said, why? Well, why you use the word incognito for Jesus? Don't forget, the transfiguration, Jesus was brighter than the sun, correct? Wouldn't it attract the attention of everyone if suddenly at midnight, you see the whole mountain blaze like the sun? <laughs> Thank you very much for thinking about that. Especially the Mexico, yeah. right? The people come, oh, what is that? You know, including all the, uh, the gangsters who live around the bushes, and say, what's that bright light coming? You know, what is that? 
People are curious. Uh, if Jesus doesn't want him to be dead, no, he will wait till sunrise the next day. And then the sun is shining everywhere. Say, yeah. And then they notice, oh, that must be a reflection of the sun. Right. That's also shining on that side. Say, ah, you know, some phenomena. If he wanted to be incognito. So may I advance that it can be possibly until the next day. When the sun started shining. And then when the sun is shining by, you know, uh, 9 a.m. or whatever, and then uh, Jesus was bright as the sun, you know, sun is there, sun is there, you know, okay, some sort of reflection, nobody asks anything. Now, it, of course, could have happened in the night time somewhere where everybody is asleep. Because remember, they might have gone to a place where there is not much civilization. Unfortunately, today, every place is developed. Do you know the Mount of Olives is just like another suburb now? <laughs> when we went to Israel, Mount of Olives, I was looking for a place where at least you climb a little bit. And then you reach the top. Ah, kind of thing. They, they, they drop you off right in the Mount of Olives. And you look and say, huh, this is just like another suburb on a hill. It's so developed, but it was not so in Jesus' time. Jesus went to this place. <laughs> where if he wanted and he knew that the transfiguration was taking place in the early morning when it's dark and the sun hasn't risen he would have gone to a place far far away from civilization he would have journeyed there but wait there were people down the hill so it was not too far either but he would be isolated enough but we conclude one thing. It sure takes a long time. Why most of you when you read Transfiguration, oh, you know Jesus there and then a few hours zzz, and then come down. Zzz. Oh, your Transfiguration story really lasts two hours. Or maybe you like the shorter version, like most churches. You know, they only want their service one hour long. So if the song leader goes for 35 minutes, oh, my rose is in the oven. Then the preacher preached beyond 20 minutes. You give him the stare. Then what kind of stare? Because your rose, rose by now is burning. Because people have one hour church. And they are not giving time to the Lord. That's why we don't see signs and wonders. Then we so don't see people grow deep in the Lord. Number one, it's a quantum time to allow absorption of spiritual energy to transform us. Number two, and that part I will use uh, Moses and I just quote it since you know the verse. When Moses came down, he says, he didn't know his face was shining. Something caught his attention. Something absorbed all of his concentration. So much he was unaware of his natural environment. How do you think Jesus prayed? Would you agree that Jesus had perfect concentration? When Jesus prayed, he gave 100% of himself to God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. He literally did that. I could see Jesus when he prayed, it was almost impossible to distract him. He, he, he gave his whole concentration to that prayer. You have a few examples of that. His prayer in Gethsemane was so intense that his sweat was blood. Hebrews tells us in chapter 5 that he made vehement cries to God. So when Jesus prayed, it took all 100% of his intellectual energy, 100% of his emotional energy, 
a hundred percent of his physical energy a hundred percent of his spiritual energy his concentration was full point number two you must give 100% concentration into the presence of God. Man, by concentrate, I don't mean that no, after work, when you ask start all night prayer, you go, you frown your wrinkle, wrinkle your forehead, <coughs> your eyebrow, <laughs> and you say, hey, why are you praying that way? Concentrating. <laughs> you know about to play a chess game with a grandmaster. You can relax to a certain extent. But what kind of concentration? It was more a concentration of perfect rest. He that has entered into the rest ceased from his own works. So I need to describe it. It's a type of entering into a rest, a place. Now, in Hebrews 4, it talks about entering the rest in verse 10. And cease from your own works. And it illustrates entering the rest as Joshua bringing the people into the land of Canaan. So the rest is like a place. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 4. As Joshua led the people into the land of Canaan, like a type of physical rest. But he says even <coughs> Joshua did not give them the true rest. The real Joshua, Jesus, whose basic meaning is Yoshua in the Hebrew, which means God is my salvation, same meaning as Joshua, gave us a true spiritual rest. And here's the thing. To enter into this place that a few people have discovered in the Bible, David calls it he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. David knew this place. David knew this place. Moses knew this place. Although there was a song of David and song of Solomon, uh, a song of uh, Moses. In Psalms chapter 91, Psalms 90, and all these songs, David sang them too. Who do you think have the composition? These are known. David always sings songs about he that dwelt between the cherubim. He knew there is a place in God. Not a physical place, but a spiritual place where you find rest. He sing about it in Psalm chapter 23. Definitely a Psalm of David. Where God makes you lie down in green pasture. There's a secret place in God. And here's the thing. Your concentration is so good that when you enter in, your body is here but you're there. Are you able to enter that place? Point one, it takes time. Point two, full concentration and full rest. When you go in into that place, even though you're not asleep, someone coming near you, you know, everybody got different behaviors and different characteristics when we pray in tongues. We do not know, you know, in Singapore still not uh, still a, a reasonable large group, but not that big yet. Here is reasonably uh, big in a small place like this. But uh, long ago in our all night prayer, we sometimes had 200, 300 people pray. You have all kinds of prayer. And, and we pray in the church auditorium. So sometimes in the middle of the night, there will be procession. So why? People who don't want to sleep. So they walk and pray. So when one person walk and pray, Others begin to follow. And they go, while the others will sit at the side or corner and they pray. <laughs> Sometimes a corner is what we call, what kind of corner we call? Happy hour corner. <laughs> and they could be very loud. 
And you know the Koreans like to pray very loudly. They thought the only form of prayer is screaming, crying and groaning. Which has its place? Most of them pray very loudly. I'm. Then on the other side, corner. The tongues is very strange. Never heard before. Where are they interpret? <laughs> <laughs> so, they won't call us. But it's important for us to know that as an individual, you can sit and pray, kneel and pray, go to the corner and pray. Once you enter the place, even if there's a nuclear explosion right next door, you stay be. Because you're intense. So you say, hey, Pastor, nuclear explosion means it goes to heaven. No, God can put a shield around him. <laughs> and so the whole thing all blasts, the whole doors, windows, and all the roof, all gone. Except this person praying with a few patches of green grass around. God can do that. But your concentration. There are few people with this kind of concentration. And you need to reach that level to break through. Hannah was one of them. She always cried. She always cried. She always asked. But one day, she was so intense because she was making a covenant with God. In her heart, she was saying, Lord, if you give me a child, I will give this child back to you. And she was, her mouth was moving, but no sound coming out. So the Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk. And then when he scolded her, she says, No, my Lord, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying in my heart. And that day was a breakthrough. There is a place in God and it's also from the quantum because if you are realistic and you are honest not every time when you pray you give yourself 100% even some of your best of your best 90% you got 10% distraction except you try not to not to be affected by the distraction but the day you enter into 100% you say, Pastor, how to have 100%? Alright. If the next day you don't pray through, you get killed. Okay. Which happened to Daniel and his three friends. Because they were about to be executed. And Daniel says, Why is, why is this urgency in executing everybody? And then Ariok says the king say the king has a dream he forgot the dream he want people to tell the dream and the interpretation and no one can impossible daniel says give us some time and during that night they pray i tell you that all night prayer must be nice because if they don't have the answer the next morning or <coughs> nobody slept. Because if they didn't pray through and get the answer, that was the end of their lives. That was some motivation. Although we shall not motivate you this way tonight. <laughs> but think about how important something is to you. And to reach that point of full concentration. <clears throat> Many of you have come all the way. In fact, most of us have come all the way <laughs> to this place. Some of us spent 30 hours traveling. Some of you drove 12 hours. This week, you say, Jesus promised. May I quote the words of our Lord Jesus, correct? Jesus said, 
in July, he will bring the first part of the outpouring. It depends on how much you believe. If you came with the attitude, Where Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. If it happens, it's fine. Doesn't happen, it's fine. Quest, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> you might go back still singing the Quest, Sarah, Sarah. Except it probably might sound quack, sec, sec, Sarah, Sarah, quack, Sarah, Sarah. Because you miss everything. Jesus has promised. That's why we put six nights of online prayer. We don't want to miss God. We want to really seek Him. We want to really fast. Really wait upon Him. And say, Lord, this is it. We are not looking for outward things. But whatever transaction must be done, this is it. If you were in the business world, and you have many projects and many businesses and endeavors. This week is your most important transaction that affect your entire business and your entire life. Amen. Think about it that way. If you are in a ministry or you have colleagues of ministry and concern, this week is the most important week to wait on the Lord to receive whatever God wants to give you that will make you rise up as a child chief feeling, as a John Wesley, as an Evan Roberts, as another apostle of the Lord. Is another great evangelist or great prophet from the Lord that will change the face of Christianity. Then you can have your full concentration. How important is it to you? That's how we must view our encounter with the Lord. Again, remember the words of our Lord Jesus who has never spoken a word that he did not keep his promise. We have fulfilled what he wants us to do. Number one, he gave us the condition. Let Aruel be full time. We have done that. Since April, right? We did that. Because he said if we didn't do that, this couldn't happen. We did that with every cause and every part of doing what we can. Number two, we have come here at this time. Exactly as he tells us. And we dedicate this time to him. He said it. He will keep his word. Whatever transactions that he has. Now, the one thing Jesus did not say, he did not talk about the transfiguration. That is a revelation that I have that I perceive that it's going to take place because I know all things come from the glory of God and I know it comes from New Jerusalem. That is the revelation that we're giving in this time. That is tied to what we are receiving. The transaction that needs to come forth. And it's up to Jesus. How are you going to transact into your life? Deposit into your life? Whether are you going to make this place blaze like the sun? Up to Him. He won't say incognito. Up to Him. We do not put conditions on our Lord when we come to Him. If we are servants, He is the Master. The servant has no right to put condition. The servants can only come expecting. Anything and everything. Knowing that I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered the heart of men, the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So the second condition, Jesus gave full concentration to loving the Father. As they loved the Father and beheld the Father, something took place. 
Number one, be aware of one time. Now, you might say, why not come? If, if it lasts 12 hours, why not come on the 12 hour? That means you sleep, 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 sleep. Then about 11 hours, you put your alarm clock. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, time. Everybody has played 12 hours. You know, you come. Now is the time. You hope to have the flow over. The transaction might take place in heaven and you find everyone. I say, everyone look normal. Because they all be brought to heaven in the spirit and all the transactions are taking place. So you set your alarm for no purpose. Anything can happen. It's up to our God and our Lord and our Master, our Lord Jesus. Second point, full concentration. Look how much concentration and absorption Moses had. Quanta, quanta, and full absorption. That is there. Uh, the third advantage that we have here, it is a prophetic time. Jesus predicted in six days, in eight days, this will happen. We are already past the midway cycle of the first seven years. There are seven times seven years. Antichrist was born last year. In other words, the timeline of God is flowing. God is looking for people, looking for those who would give themselves 100%. Like Pastor Elijah quoted again in the communion today. We have to be so out of this world that we belong to God and dedicate ourselves to that because Jesus cannot use a worldly person in this revival. Worldliness equals backsliding in this revival. He that loveth the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the dead, pride of life, is not of the Father. It's of the world. We have to give our absolute love to God and be as unworldly as our Lord Jesus. We live in the world, we make use of the things in the world. But we are not of the world. And the prophetic hour is that Jesus said He will pour out His Spirit. The timing is crucial. We are here in this part of the world because Jesus chose this part of the world. Everything is a prophetic fulfillment. And we are here at a very critical time in July, which is usually when you measure from the Passover, which is usually like March, April. And then by the time you count, you know, March, April, then you got May, June, and uh, you're coming close to, you know, about the, the Passover, you count 50 days, it's the day of Pentecost and kind of thing. And it's just right after the Jewish Passover or Pentecost, which is usually in June. And here we are getting ready for the Holy Spirit. And of all days, July the 4th. Because this outpouring is important as the third great awakening. Only God could have chosen a time that synchronized with the U.S. And in it, the first and second great awakening were affecting Europe, England, and this part of the world. Only God could have chosen a timing significant. So remember number three, the prophetic timing of God. Here we are following the prophecy. We have obeyed as much as we know how. We have physically obeyed. The only thing left now is the preparation of the heart. Have your heart, your mind also been prepared for that which God wants. So these three points are sufficient for, to meditate on. And let's all rise together. And we see a closing song. For those online, we're going to... Uh, go offline afterwards when we sing a song and then enter the prayer and then you continue your prayers in whatever way
uh, in the morning before we end, uh, we might on the transmission again. We see how the spirit leads, and uh, then we continue to see what the Lord has for us. At six a.m. later, to wait upon the Lord. I remember it's a series of waiting upon the Lord that God has for us. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. God prepare me to be a and the key of E. Thank you.